Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us. For those of you that are joining for the first time, welcome. Um, if this is not your first time watching, welcome back. This is our first conservation in the classroom of the new school year here in the US. And we just wanna wish everyone a great start to a great new year. For those that are new, um, Conservation in the Classroom connects you with WWF experts and scientists through these virtual presentations. You will get the chance to ask questions of our presenter as she is presenting that will get answered at the end of her presentation. My name is Kate. I will be your host today. And before we get started, we just want to invite everyone to say hi and introduce yourself in the chat box that you see under the video on your screen there. That chat area is also going to be where you place your questions for our presenter. You can feel free to put questions in there at any time, but just a reminder, they will be answered at the conclusion of her presentation. Also, before we get started, we want to invite you to head over to that pigeonhole website that you see on your screen, the pigeonhole.at, and enter the passcode climate change, all one word. And if you can go ahead and answer that word cloud question, we want to know what you think of or what words come to mind when you hear the phrase climate change. So go ahead and just take a few seconds to answer that question and say hi in the chat. And then we will take a look at your answers and and get started in just a minute. Okay. So I am really excited to introduce our presenter today. Her name is Mariana Panuncio Feldman, and she is a senior director here at WWF US with the climate team. So today Mariana is gonna talk to us a bit about what exactly is climate change, what's causing it, and what we can do to help. Um, we're gonna learn a lot today, guys, so I hope you're ready. So Mariana, if you just want to hop on here, turn your camera on and your microphone on and just say hi to everyone Everyone, and then we will take a look at what everyone had to say for the word cloud. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be with all of you today um, and uh, looking forward to what you've put already in the chat. Let's see what everyone had to say, what well, they thought of when they heard the words climate change. So here's everyone's answers so far, Mariana. We got a lot of a lot of things came to people's mind here. What do you think? Are we going to hear some of these today? Absolutely. Uh, great word cloud here. Um, a lot of the things that we're going to be covering today. OK, awesome. Um, all right, let's you guys will have another chance to answer another pigeonhole question at the end here. So just stay tuned. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And then Mariana, if you want to take it away and share your presentation, I think we're ready for you. Wonderful. OK, so here here we go. Let me see. I hope you can all see my screen in a second. Let me see. Wonderful. Um, Kate, I, I'm assuming that you're seeing this. Let me know if you're not. Uh, but otherwise, uh, let me uh, let us start. Um, we so, can see you're good to go. <laughs> excellent. Uh, great. Thank you. Um, so, um, let me tell you a bit about uh, me. So my name is Mariana Panuncio Feldman. Um, I am uh, originally from Argentina. I am a biologist by training. Um, I grew up in a big city, the capital of Argentina called Buenos Aires, um, which is uh, like a big city like New York. Um, and um, but I was really lucky because even though I lived in a big city, um, I grew up um, going camping and uh, with my parents. And as we did that, I really fell in love with nature. I love being out there. And I knew I wanted to study um, plants and animals when I grew up. And that's what I did. Um, and the more I learned about them, uh, the more I realized that I wanted to help protect them. And that led me to a career in conservation. Um, I was very lucky that I was able to work and live in the Amazon. And so some of the pictures that you see here um, are from, from that time. Uh, and, um, and that brought me to WWF. Um, 
And uh, as I learned, and I worked with many people in the Amazon to try to protect the forest there, and we thought about the long-term um, prospects for the Amazon forest, I learned that climate change was really something that could threaten um, those forests in the long run, as well as um, could um, could affect us all. And the more I learned about climate change, the more I wanted to work on that topic too, which then led me to now um, switching to what I do full time, which is to wake up thinking about how we can address climate change and um, how we can, in that process, not only protect the forests and the animals, but also make a better life uh, for all of us. So, um, so that's a bit about me. Um, let me see. Um, so let's switch to uh, climate change and um, and what is it and what we can do about it. Um, so right now I would ask you all to uh, look out your window and tell me what you see. Is it sunny where you live? Is it um, is it rainy? Is it cold? Is it warm? What you are looking at right now um, as you answer that question is uh, weather. Um, and uh, weather changes from moment to moment, day to day. Climate is actually those weather conditions over a longer period of time. Uh, it's over 10, 20, 30 years. And much as we want to know whether we're going to get um, uh, rain before we go out so that we put a rain jacket on, um, we also uh, need to track climate, uh, the, the, the climate in the long run because those weather conditions are really going to affect our lives in the long run. And that's what scientists have been doing now for decades. And it is out of those observations that we are realizing that we're having what is so-called climate change. So let's talk a bit more about that. So just in terms of some basic information um, so that when we talk about climate change, we are all on the same page about what we mean. Um, uh, let me tell you a bit about how our planet functions. So you probably have all heard the word atmosphere, which uh, refers to those um, gases that cover the earth like a nice cozy blanket. That makes earth super special uh, because unlike other planets, earth has uh, conditions thanks to that light but cozy blanket um, that have allowed uh, life to grow. Um, when the sun's rays come into the earth, some of that gets trapped as heat thanks to that cozy blanket. Other goes back out um, and emitted back into um, outside of earth. The challenge that we're facing is that that blanket, which has been created through millions and millions of years uh, of, of plants and animals um, doing respiration and some of our activities of us humans, as we'll talk in a second, that blanket is getting thicker because of some activities that we humans are making, we're releasing more gases into that atmosphere. And as we get more gases like what gases call as carbon dioxide and methane getting released and that blanket having more of those gases, the temperature of the air is increasing, the temperature of the ocean is increasing, and that is wrecking havoc in the whole atmospheric system, which controls the temperature that we see in different parts of the earth, uh, rainfall patterns, and other things. So, this is a really important part that we need to understand. So what has happened that is creating what is called climate change? So I think it is important to recognize that we humans have been around for quite a while on Earth. But in the last basically 250 years, we've made some changes that have been really great for um, our quality of life and for being able to um, 
uh, and you know, improve the way we live every day, but have had some un unintended consequences. So when we had the uh, what is called the Industrial Revolution, um, you may remember, you may have heard that in school. What happened was that uh, we discovered uh, that there was a way of burning um, certain things that we have on the earth, uh, what that are called fossil fuels. These are um, coal oil, natural gas. The Industrial Revolution started particularly with coal. When we realized that that which was in the earth, when we burned it, it produced energy. That was an amazing thing at the time because it allowed us to um, uh, transform that energy, for example, into steam, as you see in this old train. And it allowed us to transport goods over long distances, much more effectively than before with horses. Um, it also allowed us to um, start producing machines that were powered with that energy, which allowed us to produce more things that gave us basic goods to improve our quality of life. It basically unleashed a new era of development for the world. That is a good thing. But what happened in the process is that we did not realize how we as humans were actually going to transform the atmosphere in the process. That process of burning fossil fuels, which now uh, basically 70% of the energy um, uh, of the emissions that we produce as, a, as humans around the world is tied to the production of energy, tied in turn to the combustion, the burning of fossil fuels we are emitting in the process of burning these fossil fuels so much in terms of carbon dioxide and other gases that we're literally transforming um, the atmosphere and we're making that blanket thicker. The other thing that we are doing, we have been doing much more of is what is called deforestation. And deforestation is basically the destruction of forests and other habitats such as grasslands and other things um, to produce more food, um, to put more cattle on. And sometimes we do it in a way that is not really taking care of the soil when we do the agriculture such that then we use up the soil and then move somewhere else and burn more forests. And that's not a good thing. And we've been destroying forests at an alarming rate. And that is also releasing more of those gases, which in turn is making the blanket thicker. So burning of fossil fuels in amounts we had never seen before and the destruction of forests and other important habitats is what is right now leading uh, leading causes for climate change. So how do we see climate change um, into um, coming into our lives? Well, your word cloud, the one that we built together today with all of your ideas, gave us some really good examples of how we're seeing climate change, um, you know, show up in our lives. So what is it that we're seeing? And I wanted to start with the story of turtles, because sometimes we, uh, we're going to talk about some other things that you put in the cloud. But as it turns out, um, climate change really affects us all. It affects animals and plants and all of us in many different ways and ways that we have not foreseen. So take the example of marine tur turtles. Do you know where marine turtles lay their eggs? I imagine that many of you in the chat will be able to uh, respond to that question. Well, they put their eggs in the sand, in beaches. Did you know that what determines whether you get a male turtle or a female turtle? Well, what determines that is the temperature of the sand. And what are we seeing is that as the temperature of the sand increases more rapidly than we had ever seen before, when the temperature gets higher, you get more female turtles. So what before would have been a balance between male turtles and female turtles hatching, now what you're seeing is that we're starting to see more female turtles. Well, you would say, well, that's not a problem, but when over time you get more and more and more female turtles, well, the female turtles are going to have to find male turtles in the future to lay more eggs. And that could be a problem for the long-term viability of turtles. 
take our um, take a look at the monarch butterfly. Well, the monarch butterfly, which is this amazing traveler who goes from Canada and the US all the way to Mexico and back, relies on a very important plant called the milkweed to make that journey. They lay their eggs on the milkweed. They then, the larvae feed on the milkweed. Eventually the adults feed on the nectar of the milkweed. Well, as the temperatures increase and we're seeing more droughts in places where the monarch does its journey and milkweed live, we're seeing milkweed populations decline. And if there, are, if there is less milkweed, what do you think is gonna happen with the monarch butterflies? The monarch butterflies cannot do it without the milkweed. So that's another challenge. And what we're seeing is not just impact on individual species, but on the interactions between species. Let's take that one step further. We're seeing that as a result of climate change with temperatures increasing in the air, we also see temperatures increasing in the oceans. The oceans play a super important role in absorbing the extra heat that is getting generated. Well, what happens is that the temperature of the oceans increase, you start seeing effects on the animals and the um, plants that live in the ocean. And coral reefs, you know how important um, they are for many species that depend on them. Well, as it turns out, they're super sensitive to temperature. And as the temperature of the ocean increases, and sometimes you get these rapid increases at certain points in the year, what you get is the algae that are part of the corals gets released. And when they get released, the corals bleach, they become white. And if that persists for a long time, the algae cannot come back in and the corals die. And if the corals die, then a lot of the species that live in those coral reefs cannot survive well either. Well, but let's bring it closer to home. We're also starting to see climate change because it is affecting the atmosphere, meaning the temperatures, the rainfall patterns, everything is getting accelerated. And what we're starting to see are ex what are known as extreme events, which you had big in that word cloud at the beginning of our conversation, get more intense and more frequent. So take floods, take hurricanes, take you know other, other events those are happening more frequently and more intensely. We are seeing on the news, the forest fires in California, where there are different causes that are bringing this about. Climate change is basically um, making the situation worse um, and therefore making these forests more likely to burn. What we're also seeing is that these are not just one-off extreme events. What you're seeing is that while the whole planet is getting warmer, you're seeing those impacts be different depending on what part of the earth you're in. So some places are going to get much drier in the long run, making it harder for people to live there, to grow their crops, etc. We're also seeing other places get colder or other places uh, um, uh, colder, sorry, uh, other places, um, uh, the conditions in those places change. So take the Arctic. You don't have the same amount of warming everywhere on Earth at the same time. What you're actually getting is some places are getting warmer faster. The tempers are in the Arctic are twice, the, the Arctic is warming up twice as fast as other parts of the world. And as a result, you're getting more rapid melting of ice. And all of the species that depend on ice to be able to hunt, to be able to move, um, are being affected in the process. And the people who live in the Arctic, who have their houses in the, in, on the ice or on the permafrost, are also uh, being affected and having to move entire towns because of this and their ways of life being affected too. So what can we do about this? Let's take a second and just recognize that climate change is a big issue. It is affecting many of the things that we love. It is affecting us directly. It is affecting other people around the world. So what can we do about it? It's a big issue. Well, the first thing I want you all to know is that there are many people working to solve this challenge.
This is something important. And there are many people around the world who are working to make a difference on this and to solve it and address it in a way that will create a safer future for you and for all of us. One example of that is that five years ago, Almost 200 countries came together, recognizing that climate change is such an important issue to sign the first universal agreement to tackle climate change. It is called the Paris Agreement. And that basically sets a blueprint for us to tackle this challenge together as one humankind that we are, taking action where we live, but with a shared goal of where we need to go. But this addressing this climate, uh, climate change and addressing this challenge that we face is something that involves us all. And what I want to know is that all of us have a responsibility. All of us can make a difference. And we really need all of you. We need everyone around the world to take this um, seriously and to throw their heart into this so that we can actually um, address climate change but also create a better life for all of us in the process. The big question that I want you to ask yourselves is can we live the lives that we live by and large with the main basic comforts that we have while not producing as much carbon dioxide? The answer is yes, we do have solutions. We know what we need to do, but we all, all, all now need to roll up our sleeves and do it. And we're starting to do it, but we need much more of it. So what can we do? Well, we know that, as I said before, we burn fossil fuels in different ways. When we put gasoline into our car, we use oil. When we switch on the light, we oftentimes use coal or other fossil fuels. When we take a shower, we use natural gas. So there are things in the way that we live our lives. When we eat food, it's it got produced in ways that burned um, uh, fuels too. Uh, so we know that um, there are different ways in which we are, um, um, you know, contributing to this. So what can we do? One of the first things that you can do is change the way you get around. So transportation is a, an important way in which we emit carbon dioxide. And we can do things such as instead of using our private cars, we can carpool. We can use public transportation. When you go to school, think about how you go to school after the pandemic. Um, how do you get to school? You can carpool. You can use public transportation. You can bike. There are ways in which you can reduce what is called your carbon footprint, how much you produce to move around. We can also switch to renewable energy. We now know that we can use other sources of energy besides fossil fuels. We can use the energy of the sun. We can use the energy of the wind. We can use so many other forms of energy to power our lives. It's also very important to know that producing food is a contributor to climate change, but of course we need to eat. So what do we do? There are better techniques that can be used to produce food, but we also can take responsibility by not wasting, not wasting food, not wasting water. That is a super important contribution as well. We also can be more mindful about what we buy. Do we need everything that we buy or are there certain things that maybe we don't need as much of? Recycling. Let's give a new life to the things that have been already produced so that they can be used to produce other things. Let's recycle. That can also help address climate change. And now let's go bigger. We can also plant trees and protect forests because they play a very important role in acting as what is called carbon sinks. They can help us absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. They can help us um, address climate change. And in so doing, they can do other things. They help us retain the soil. They help reduce temperature in cities when you plant uh, trees in cities, etc. I think that what is also important is that um, 
we go beyond our individual actions. The way we're going to produce change is if we get others involved as well. So talk to your friends, talk to your family. You can help inspire others to take action too. raise awareness about this and actually help us all build a better life for everyone. Take action in your community. Um, you can help drive some of these changes in your school, in your town. Youth, kids are amazing forces for positive change on, on this issue. And you can be uh, play a leadership role too. And then we need to raise our voices. Our leaders, the leaders that we elect, are the ones who can set the direction for our countries overall and help us address this issue faster. So when we come together with others to say, we want a safer future for us, for our children, and for the children of our children, uh, but we want a safer future now. In this generation, we can do it together in a constructive way so that our leaders listen. So with that, I wanted to say that WWF uh, believes deeply, and this is why I love working for this organization, that together we can make a difference. WWF works around the world with kids and adults here in the United States and in many, many, many other countries. And together we can address climate change together, we can create a safer future for us all. So thank you so much for listening. And I really look forward to uh, continuing our conversation. Thank you so much, Mariana. That was great. And as she said, we are going to get started with our question and answer portion here in just a minute. So just as a reminder to everyone to go ahead and place your questions for her in that chat box and we will try to get to as many questions as we can. Before we dive into that though, I want to just take a really quick second to remind everyone to head back over to the Pigeonhole website um, that you see on your screen there. We've added a second question, a poll question. So you're going to enter the same passcode that you did in the beginning of climate change altogether, one word, and go ahead and answer the poll question. So we want to know which actions you will commit to to help reduce those impacts of climate change. Mariana gave you some great examples of things that you can do every day in your behaviors and just your daily lives. So go ahead and answer that question. And at the end of the Q&A, we will go ahead and take a look at what the most popular answers were. Okay, Mariana, are you ready for some questions? Yes, I am. Perfect. All right. So let's get started. Our first one here is from Aiden, who wants to know, are cars better to use than trains when it comes to burning fossil fuels? Well, that's a great question, Aiden. What I would say is that if you have access to a train, a train is a great idea because if you notice, in a train, we can put more people, whereas in a car, we can drive ourselves, or better to say, your parents, um, or maybe you can have uh, uh, two or three friends with you. That's it. That's as much as many people we can pack in a car. Whereas in a train, we can pack many more people. And when you think about it, the amount that you would burn in fossil fuels um, uh, when you're traveling in a train is less per person than what you burn in a car. So if you have access to train or any other form of tra uh, public transportation is, um, is, is a better choice. And you know what? On top of that, it's great because if you are going on the train with your mom and with your dad, they can be talking with you and relaxing at the same time. So it's also great for the parents. So multiple benefits there. That's good. Um, our next question here is from a group called the Webheads. They want to know which oceans are increasing temperature the fastest. Ooh, that's a great question. I actually don't know um, which um, ocean is burning the fastest, but we can find out for you. What I can tell you for sure, as I was saying in the presentation, is that right now we're seeing the poles warming faster. Um, and so if I had to take a hint, I would say, look at those, but we'll, we'll get back to you with that great question. Okay, NRT sheep pasture want to know, does permafrost hold large amounts of carbon? Mm, great point. 
So that's a, that's a great um, a great thing that you brought to the table. And uh, yes, um, so basically what permafrost does is that it has, um, what you have is uh, uh, earth that is under that, that holds large amounts of carbon, as you just said. And one of the worries that we have about climate change is that as the earth warms up, the permafrost is melting. And as it melts, it's basically exposing those grounds with lots of packed carbon over a long time in them. And you may have heard the term positive feedback loop. Basically, what that means is that things get accelerated, right? So as the earth warms up, the permafrost melts. As that releases carbon, it basically speeds up, it makes the earth warm up faster, which then further melts more permafrost, which makes it go faster and faster. So this is why taking action as soon as possible is very important so that we can actually help slow down these processes, um, these positive feedback uh, loops, um, such as the one with permafrost. Okay, it looks like we have another question here from the webheads. They want to know what exactly causes these extreme events. Hmm. So I think there are a series of, um, of variables that come into play for these extreme events, but let's take the case of hurricanes, for example. We know that when, um, when you get a warmer ocean, a warmer ocean basically accelerates the movement of air on top of the ocean. That leads to um, basically the creation of hurricanes. So the warmer the ocean, the more hurricanes you get they are more intense, as I said before, and they are more frequent. We are seeing that every year, you know, that we go through the alphabet with names for the various hurricanes. And if you notice over the years, we're getting to the letters faster. And that's because the conditions in the ocean are leading to more hurricanes. So what you're getting is the atmospheric system is in a bit on overdrive. And if it is an overdrive, it leads to more and more of these extreme events. Okay, our next question is from Chelsea, who wants to know, how would you suggest keeping students feeling positive about mm -hmm. climate change? That's a great question. Ah, uh, Chelsea, um, thank you so much for that question, um, because that's one that I wake up thinking about every day, given that I work on climate change every single day. What gives me hope is, first of all, that I am doing something about it. It is very hard to feel hopeful when you feel like you're sitting there watching from the fringes, right? So first of all, knowing that you are taking action personally is a great way. The other thing, as I said before, is that you're not alone in addressing this issue. There are other kids like you who are taking action too. There are grown-ups who are taking action too. We need much more of that, but you are not alone in seeing that climate change is an important issue to address for animals, for plants, for our lives. And what I would say is also what gives me uh, um, hope is that it's not just that we're seeing others take action, but that these actions are gaining momentum, are gaining strength. So take action on your own talk to others to involve them, and also keep reading about the rays of hope in places where we are making a difference. And the last thing that I would say is what gives me hope is that when we're addressing climate change, we are talking about creating a better life with the technologies of the 21st century. As I said before, can we live a good life without relying so much on the burning of carbon dioxide? We can. Can we have a better life in the process? We can too. If we pollute less, the air in our cities will be better. If we address climate change, we are gonna be better prepared to address with these extreme events. Basically in the process of addressing climate change, we can create better lives for all of us. So it's for many reasons that it makes sense to address climate change. So all of that gives me hope. That was a great answer. 
our next question here from Tata wants to know, I know that some places are actually getting colder due to climate change, but I'm not sure how that happens. Can you explain that? Ah, so, I mean, it basically the, the simpler, um, you know, explanation is that the climate, the weather conditions vary by in different parts of the earth. Um, and so what you're seeing is the conditions are varying in different in different places. That I would say is like the easiest way of explaining it. But what you need to keep in mind, and this is the part where it's important for people not to get confused. First of all, is the question I would ask is, is the place you're thinking about a place where you're getting a little hiccups of it's getting colder sometimes, or is the long-term trend one of getting colder? Because sometimes people get confused with the cold spells and they're not looking at the long-term trend, right? The second part um, is that overall, even if you're getting places where the conditions are, well, but it's getting colder, so why do we have climate change? Is that for the earth as a whole, it is unmistakable that the earth is getting warmer, the air is getting warmer, the ocean is getting warmer, and basically this is completely tied to, as I mentioned before, the burning of fossil fuels and the rise in, in, in deforestation. So we need to be able to keep the long term in mind. And while the difference, the pockets might be different in different places, keep that, um, keep that in mind so that we address it squarely. Okay, it looks like we have a few minutes left here to answer just a few more questions. A few uh, questions came in actually about food waste. So I'm gonna combine two questions. One from Hanby Elementary that wants to know what is the best way to be less wasteful with food? Mm -hmm. And then the question that's kind of related to it from Palm Panthers is how does not wasting food connect with helping climate change? Can mm -hmm. you give just a little more information about that? So if yeah. you kind of want to answer those together, Miriam. Yeah. Oh, great questions. Great questions. Because I mean, this really goes to show how every aspect of our lives is in a way you know, tied to climate change. So think about how we produce food, right? Like when we produce food, like making it super simplified, right, is we produce food, if we're using a plot of land that is already uh, deforested, okay, let's focus on that. But if you, in some places of the world, they're still advancing on forest to produce land. So the first impact of climate change is if you're burning what was natural forest and natural ecosystems to produce food. That is one place where you're getting, uh, you're producing climate, you're contributing to climate change. But then the practices that are used in the process of producing the food also contribute to climate change. So for example, think about if the food is produced with agrochemicals, those agrochemicals are derived from fossil fuels. So that is contributing to climate change. Um, there are certain, um, you know, there are certain practices tied to, um, you know, uh, burning of cover or there are practices in how the, the food is produced that can also um, contribute to climate change. And we have alternatives for all of this. We know that we can care for the soil so that we don't need to the forest. We know that we can produce with less agrochemicals so that we don't contribute to it. We know that there are certain um, uh, uh, practices that we can use, such as rotation of crops, so that you don't need to burn as much uh, uh, cover. So there are different things that we can do to address um, um, how the food is produced. And then the transportation. You can buy local as opposed to buying something that came from the other side of the world. That also contributes to, to climate change in the process. So what can we do to produce to waste less? is um, uh, simple things such as thinking like really are we going to eat the food that we're gonna um, you know that we're gonna uh, buy uh, sometimes we get really excited about things that we see and we want to have it all but are we really going to eat it all the other thing is then using the leftovers um, um, you know, and then what you put on your plate, are you really going to eat everything? This is like the favorite question of the moms and the dads, right? Are you really going to eat everything in your food, in, in your plate? If not, put less and then help yourself to more and use leftovers. So planning better, eating what you're really going to eat, and then using leftovers is a great way. Um, some of the great ways to reduce food waste. Great. Okay. I think we have just enough time for Two more. Um, we have a question here from Earth Kids TV that they want to know if you take water from the areas with floods and put that water in areas with droughts, would that solve any problems? Hmm. 
That's a great question. Well, the, the question I would say is how close they are to each other, because while that idea is great in principles, it would be great that those who have too much, they give it to the ones who don't have enough. Sometimes they are not close to each other. And oftentimes that's the challenge. So we cannot just solve the issue by moving water from one place to the other. Rather, what we need to do is to prepare for the places that are more prone to floods, um, to be able to prepare so that the, uh, the, the water can flow better and so that we can protect people and infrastructure for the damage that you know will will occur and for the places that have drought um, actually be mindful of using less water in those places and then preparing for those those droughts with measures so that we have enough water for the people and the animals and the crops that 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 live there um, but it's um it would be amazing if you can develop a way to get water from one place to another faster. That would help a lot of people. Okay, let's see. Our next question here from McCraw Homeschool want to know what would you say is the easiest and most effective way for elementary school age children to contribute to conservation and help climate change? Hmm. So you know what? You can be in kindergarten, you can be in elementary school, you can be in high school. All of the things that I mentioned in the presentation are things that you can do no matter what age you have. You can talk to mom and dad about walking or biking or taking public transportation. You can talk to mom and dad about cooking with them and then saying, I'm going to eat what's on my plate first. And then if I want more, I'll get more. Um, you can um, talk to your mom and your dad about where your the energy from, you know, when you switch on the light, where it comes from. Mom and dad, is there any way that we can switch to renewable energy? There are many things that you can do in terms of your life by just asking questions. And then you can see whether those same questions can be applied to the places where you spend your time. So how, where does, um, you know, the food that your school um, get come from? Is it local food? Is it from far away? How does your uh, school get powered with electricity? So the same things, asking questions is a great way to get conversations started and to produce change. And then again, talking to others and then getting projects going, I, it's a fantastic way to. Um, we can all make a difference from being, you know, really, really young all the way to grownups. I think that's a great question for us to end on today, Mariana. I think, unfortunately, we are running short on time. So if you have questions still left for Mariana, you can keep putting them in the chat. We'll write them down and do our best to get them back to you. Before we wrap up, uh, we want to take a look and see what you guys had to say for which action you will take to help reduce those impacts of climate change. So, Mariana, you can see our answers there from everyone that participated. So. It looks like we have a lot of <laughs> we have a lot of action being taken here. So I, I like to see that. This is so exciting. I love it. And these are all things that you can do. And you know what? Here is a little secret. You can do more than one. You can also <laughs> dip into the others. So this is this is amazing. Uh, please go on and do these things. And I think that together. We can solve this issue. We need all of you engage and talk to others so that we get more people taking these actions. Thank you so much for committing to these. That's great. So I just wanna give a huge thanks to everyone that joined us today and that participated in those pigeonhole polls and the word cloud. I also wanna give a huge, huge thank you to Mariana for spending some time to talk to us about climate change. And just a reminder, teachers and parents, we have more materials available on Wild Classroom about climate change, including a worksheet to go along with Mariana's presentation. So be sure to check that out. Like I said, if you have more questions for her that did not get answered, you can also email them to wildclassroom at wwfus.org and we will do our best to pass those along to her and get some answers back to you. So thanks so much, everyone. We will see you next time. Thanks again, Mariana. Thank you, bye.